Thank you very much. Well, I think we all, we all know how immense, tremendously successful deep neural networks and in general artificial intelligence is these days. I mean, we see it all around us. Um, for instance, self-driving cars, surveillance tasks, legal issues. So for instance, in the States, job applications are often already pre-screened by neural networks and also the whole healthcare sector, which unfortunately these days became even more important as it already is. And so there are, these methods are used, for instance, for imaging modalities, um, but also for reaching critical decisions. But if you look a bit closer, what you realize, I mean, uh, Robert said, I'm a mathematician by training, then you see that uh, the results are often spectacular, but there is not a sufficient amount of theory to actually explain and understand their success and understand also how, for instance, decisions are reached. And maybe even more, I mean, sometimes uh, in certain cases for small term perturbations, uh, you observe dramatic failure. So for instance, think of these examples for self-driving cars, where people put stickers on signs and then the car suddenly makes a very different erratic decision. Now, on the other hand, we have the modeling world. But in the modeling world, where we worked for a long time with very precise physical models, building methodologies on those, uh, these methods often reach their boundary. And um, so let me explain this to you at one example, which will also be the running example in this talk. So this is computer tomography. Now, computer tomography does the following. You have a human body and you compute line integrals through it. And then this one slice is one slice of a sinogram. And then you rotate. Uh, and so this way you fill your complete sinogram. Now, sometimes you cannot do the full rotation of 180 degrees, but only a fraction of this. And what this leads to is the fact that you only have a chunk of the sinogram. So you have a huge missing concatenated piece. This is called limited angle computer tomography. And then when you recover, recover from the sinogram, the interior of the body, you see this is your original uh, image, but this is what you then get if you have a certain degree of angle missing. You see, you have missing parts here and here. And the problem here um, is that this type of data is just too complex for a precise mathematical or physical modeling. Uh, so we cannot model the interior of the human body accurately enough. And so that calls for learning methods. Um, but what turned out in various applications is that the best is not to throw everything overboard of these, this modeling world, but to combine in a smart way data-driven and model-based approaches. Uh, and so here in this case, the data-driven side will be always deep learning, deep neural networks. And then the question is always, how can you optimally balance this? And in this talk, I would like to show you one, let's say, conceptual type of approaches one can pursue in this respect. And I would like to start now on the modeling world. So I'd like to introduce to you one method, how you can actually solve this image reconstruction problem where computer tomography is one particular instance of it. Uh, we will see this is a methodology which is called sparse regularization. Um, it involves certain representation systems. And so I would like to now briefly um, introduce this and then we will come to the deep learning world and see how we can connect both. So, in a very classical sense, this is the standard method how you solve such type of problems. So this is your original image. Let's say this is your operator, your measurement operator. So in case of the uh, of computer tomography, this is a radon transform, but it can be also something very different. For instance, if you do denoising, then K would put noise on your image. And then from this G, from the noisy image, you would like to recover it. Oh, so this is a problem, inverse problem. We want to invert this operation, this operator. And what people do is they solve this minimization problem. Um, so you see what happens if you do that. This is the so-called data fidelity term. So if you minimize this, you would like to solve this problem as accurately as possible. And then you have another term which allows you to incorporate properties of the solution. 
And so the big question is always how to choose this additional term. And then you see you have this parameter alpha, which helps you to balance between both. Do you want to put more emphasis on a certain property of the solution, or do you put more emphasis on that you solve this as accurately as possible? Now, how to choose the penalty term? Um, I would like to advocate a certain conceptual approach in this direction, which is based on the observation that the word is compressible. Uh, so what you always have is, let's say you have an image, you always have a transform, uh, so mapping into this, which in a certain sense reveals the information content and shows also that the information content is sparse. Uh, it's very small. And what you see here is that if you do this transform, this is the so-called wafer transform, uh, the white parts are the information content and everything which is dark and black is almost equal to zero. Uh, and so what you do in reality is you compute this transform, so you compute inner products of your image with so-called wavelets, and you see some of these wavelets here, so you basically test where in which sense they are contained in this image. Uh, and so this is, if you like, the mathematical found formulation, this is what wavelets are. You have one function which you move around at which you then also scale to you. Uh, and so this is also the... Um, basis for the JPEG 2000 compression standard. Now, I said you always find such a transform and then you can, you will also hopefully find it for, for your data, which you would like to recover. And how do you penalize this now? How do you choose this penalty term? Well, I mean, there there's the observation that the L1 norm promotes sparsity. So let me explain this to you. If I have all my possible solutions on this line, um, then if I have the R2 ball, this is this red thing. If I blow it up, it will hit the line somewhere. That's the minimal L2 norm solution. But if I do that with the R1 norm, you see the solution is this. And this is a, um, a point which has one zero component and one non-zero component, whereas this has two non-zero components. So this is much sparser. So therefore, the L1 norm promotes sparsity. And so this is a canonical choice in this approach of sparse regularization, um, where you choose this penalty or also called regularization term in this way. So then the big question is, how do you choose these representation systems? We saw already wafers, that's obviously one choice, but there's a better choice than this. And so let me guide you uh, to that conclusion so that you see why there's a reason to go beyond wafers. The reason for this is that images, no matter of which type, are typically governed by edge-like structures, direction structures. Yeah? So you see this here, you also see it in images like this. And wavelets are not that good because they are, you see, like a little square. First of all, to detect edges, they have, uh, sorry, to detect the direction of edges, but most importantly, if you want to represent an edge, you need a lot of those. But you aim for sparsity, you aim for very few terms. And so what would be much better is if you have direction-based, so-called anisotropic elements. Now, this leads from wavelets to what is called shearlets, which we introduced some time ago. Uh, you see the definition here, but let me illustrate this to you, what happens. Um, so you have one component where you move everything on the plane. You have another parameter where you zoom into the signal, but you do it now in an anisotropic-like fashion to get the elements which are directional-based. Um, and then you also have another a third parameter to change the orientation of those. And if you are familiar with... Um, frequency space or in medical imaging, you would say K space. Then you see that shearlets tile the frequency domain or, uh, or the K space in this way. So you have a low frequency content and then you have different scales, which each element gives you a very precise directional decomposition. Okay, so this was the intuition. You can make this all mathematically precise and show that these are, in a certain sense, optimal. I don't want to go in the details there. Let me just say that if you take a certain model situation of images, 
which are in some sense governed by curve-like structures, so which illustrate this phenomena, which we said is uh, predominant in imaging, then for those shear lids give, in a certain sense, the optimal compression rate. And if you want to try things out with, with the system, we have an extensive software package, shearlab.org, so you can go there. We have a transform in 2 and 3D, and no matter which language you speak, we have it here in MATLAB, Julia, Python, and also TensorFlow. Okay, so this was about, let's say, edge structures, and we argued that if you have edge structures present, then obviously you need um, shearlets instead of wafers. But there is another advantage, and this is uh, the following. So let me again go to limited angle computer tomography. Now you see a bit, if you like, mathematical formulas. Uh, you see the precise definition of what a CT scanner does. It's a so-called rod or transform, but it's it's what I just said before. You compute line integrals here uh, of a different angle and a different offset. And things become very difficult if you go to limited angle computer tomography. So if you, the angle, the range of angles you acquire is significantly smaller than the entire, let's say, uh, circle. Now, so this is, for instance, in these applications, the problem. Now, let's assume you have a very tiny angle, minus 15, 15 degrees, where you can only acquire your data. If you reconstruct from that by what, the classical method, you see, you see almost nothing. But then if you increase the angle, the reconstruction gets better and better. But what you also observe is that at a very early stage, you already see certain structures very precisely. And this does not depend only on the fact that you have an edge here. It depends on the directionality of the edge. And so one can see that at an early stage, so for instance, if you now compute line integrals in this direction, then these edges are already visible. These are not because they are smeared out. Okay, so what, what does this mean? It means we not only need to take edges into account, but also their direction. And so there is a precise notion for this, again, which I don't want to go into the details, which um, gives you the points of the where edges occur and their directionality. Ah, so it's a subset of R plus times zero pi. And you can mimic this also in this phase space diagram. And Really, I mean, shields can identify this object, this wavefront set, so singularity points, so edge points together with their direction. Just by looking at the shielded transform, going to very fine scales and looking at their behavior and their decay behavior. In a sense, I mean, shields are a representation system which are, in a certain sense, universal, a lot of very nice properties. Um, optimal representations, even high spatial localization, and also a faithful implementation. So let's now go uh, into the data part, which is here the deep learning. So models meet, meet, meet data. In this case, means shields meet deep learning. But let's first talk a bit about um, how, what maybe typical deep learning approaches are to inverse problems. Maybe the easiest or in a certain sense, I mean, something straightforward you can do is you can recover with your favorite recovery method and then train a CNN to remove noise and artifacts afterwards. Yeah, so you have a pipeline, you first recover with your model-based method, and then you put a CNN afterwards because CNNs are really good for removing noise. So that's one approach, maybe a bit smarter in a sense is this plug and play with CNN denoising, where you take a classical solver, iterative solver, you in a sense break it open. It usually contains a denoising step, and then you just replace this step with a trained convolutional neural network, which is already trained for denoising. Yeah, so therefore it's called plug and play. You can do even a bit more and uh, not just contain this denoising step, but contain also other steps, maybe with parameterized operators, where you then also learn the parameters. Here you can just plug in a, a trained CNN. And then there's a bit different approach where you assume um, that your 
original image or your original data comes from a generative model. So this is the direction of generative models prior. What I would like to show you here uh, is a certain um, type of combining model-based and data-driven methods where, as I say here, the general mission statement is to use model-based methods as far as they are reliable because these are based on physical models. We have complete control over those and then complement it with deep learning only when it is really necessary. So the guiding principle, as one I guess could already see from before, are that edges are the key features of images and so one aims to recover those in a certain sense and also recover the wavefront set so in that sense paying particular attention to edge structures and direct and the directionality of those and then the shielded transform will be always used to sense those okay so this is the first approach i would like to um, introduce we call it learning the invisible um, and you will see why this name is justified so again the philosophy is we first use the model-based world here we use sparse regularization as far as it's reliable and then we complement it by a neural network uh, so this picture we are already familiar with it came from limited angle computer tomography that will be also the problem we will solve here um, and we already discussed there are edges which are visible and not visible. So in that sense, I mean, in this point uh, direction diagram, we need to in-paint certain parts, we need to recover certain parts. And for this to share the transform is um, very, let's say, um, suitable as we also discussed. Now, let's look at the algorithm, what we do there. We first solve a sparse regularization problem, which we discussed, we have here the data fidelity term. With a radon transform, we have here the R1 minimization part, sparse regularization of the shielded transform, also with some weights for the different scales. Now we get F star, which is now a blurry version in a certain sense, because as we said, the model-based approach cannot solve it accurately. And so what we then do is we then apply again the shielded transform. And so certain coefficients, so these are inner products of F star with my shielded elements are almost equal to zero, but others are already reliable and nearly perfect. Now, so we have here from the indices of machines visible ones and invisible ones. And now I know what I don't need to touch, namely those. I only now touch those which are not reliable at this point. And then I train a neural network from the visible coefficients to learn the invisible ones. Oh, and so what I get out is F, I now um, combine with my visible coefficients, I bring it back to the image to map. Okay, so we use, as usual in inverse problems, a unit, so a convolutional neural network with a certain structure where you first decrease the image size and then you expand it in a way to extract the key features here, but to not lose too much information the network also has some skip connections and we have a certain uh, loss function which we apply. And so the, the ma main idea here is again what I said, we now know what the convolutional neural network does. We use it in a very surgical manner. Um, and what we think has also an advantage is that the neural network does not process the entire image. So in that sense, we get also a bit more stability. The disadvantage is everything is dominated by the L1 minimization procedure. Okay, so let me show you some numerical experiments. This uh, is data coming from a Mayo clinic. Um, we have 10 patients, nine for training, one for testing. And then we use, uh, uh, so we have here a 60 degree missing angle. We then, this is the, the data the network has seen. We then test it for testing generalization ability to a very different data set where Colleagues uh, from Helsinki have sliced the lotus root, put some metal things in, and then put that in the scanner. And so here we have a third degree missing wedge. Now, this is the original image. This is a crude reconstruction filtered back projection, um, where this is the relative error, and this is a measure for image quality, which we introduced, which is better than the self-similarity index. It's based on so-called hard weights. 
TV. This is the sparse regularization reconstruction. Um, you see it is still, although it's better than the other, it is still, it has some blurry parts here. Now, the next we'll be applying the new network to the entire image. And this is what you get. Yeah, so I'll go back and forth maybe. You see, I mean, you see a bit more structures, but still, if you look at those parts, I mean, it's still, I mean, not, uh, not something you would like to maybe use in detail. Uh, also here, you see still certain, yeah, the, the blur in a way is still hitting you. And also, if you observe this part, it's not a fair reconstruction. Uh, but now, I mean, if you go to our approach, you see is now, Suddenly, I mean, this curve is closed, and here you see that it's actually a very precise reconstruction. Right? So let me go back. This was the model-based approach, the pure data-driven approach, and that's the combined approach. If you like metrics, I mean, in numbers here you have a lot: relative error, PSNR, self-similarity index, harp psi. Um, you see that our approach, which I depicted here again, is um, outperforms the others by far um, now to our, let's say, image quality measure approach, this harp psi, what we showed that it achieves higher correlation with human opinion scores. That's how you test these measures. Also the self similarity index, and it can be computed very efficiently. And if you like um, to download the code, you can get that from this webpage, harpsci.org. Let me now show you the generalization ability. So you see here, this is the, um, the lotus root with some, some metal objects. This is the ground truth, the filtered back projection, the crude reconstruction TV. This is uh, with sparse regularization with shear lids. So you see also here, it is not precise. Now, if you apply deep learning to the entire image, you see yeah, a lot of artifacts. So the deep learning approach, maybe because you apply it to the entire image, um, doesn't perform, doesn't generalize that well. But if you then apply our approach, you get a very nice reconstruction. So in that sense, this also shows that this approach is in that sense able to generalize to other data sets. Let me now come to, to a second application, which um, is about edge extractor, but we will then also draw the curve again back to um, computer tomography. So here, what we now first aim to do is we want to extract points and their directionality and then use that later on. And again, we will use a model and a data different part. The model based part here will be the shear transform, um, which will prepare the data for my neural network. And then we use a neural network in a certain sense in shear domain. And you see how the algorithm um, performs or how the algorithm is set up. You first apply the shielded transform to the image. Um, then in a certain sense, you consider take out patches of shielded coefficients and you train a neural network on such patches uh, so that the network can predict 180 directions on each of the patches. And so here are some numerical examples. This is the original image. You see it's an artificial image. You have some geometric structures which are blurred. For a human, that's not difficult to recognize. For model-based approaches, that's much harder to accurately find actually the edges. And let me also tell you that the color coding here is the directionality. So depending on the direction of the edge, the color changes. And this is what we can do with our approach, which we call density. So also if you compare it to other approaches, it outperforms those again by far. Now, a bit more complicated image is this boat image, where maybe human would be um, would just recognize this as an edge, and then you have here the um, the model-based approaches. They are not bad, but then if you look at the combined approach, you see you can extract very fine details and also get the color coding in a very precise way. Okay, so this is extracting or determining um, singularities or edge points together with their directionality. And again, I mean, now if you compare this, 
let's say the the metrics, the scores, even compared to other approaches which incorporate deep learning, this combined or hybrid approach outperforms the others by far. Now coming back to um, computer tomography, you see what we can do here to use these, this approach. Remember now we have an approach which in a certain sense determines edge structures and their directions. Now, so we have the sinogram at hand. We can detect this wave front set, which are the, the edge points together with their direction. The wave front set and the sinogram, then there's a relation which can bring this back to the um, image domain, and then one can use this wave front set, so the points and direction as a prior for reconstruction. Uh, so that's, for instance, one way. One way to use this, I mean, if you use it this way, if you, for instance, has a low dose sinogram, you also need to in paint the wave front set. Um, and maybe you don't want to use the inverse canonical relation, but you can also use a neural network in a way to push it to the image to make. But so using it in this direction, um, let me just show you two also numerical results um, which we recently derived. This is again about limited angle, and we have now an 80 degree missing angle, which is a huge chunk. Um, that's the ground truth. And so this reconstruction is uh, already one of these uh, deep learning approaches, which I told you before. It is this learned primal dual, which in some sense uses the classical iterative methods, but break those open and insert uh, neural networks in a certain sense where you learn those parameters as well. Now, so it's a bit more sophisticated than these plug and play, which I talked about. But you see, I mean, the quality is not, not that great. But then if you use this approach um, where we use uh, the wave front set in a certain sense, where shields are um, where shields are um, a pre-processing and combine this in, in a certain way, I mean, then you can improve this image to this quality. You can do something similar for the low dose, where you have 80, 80 angles now at hand. Again, I mean, an algorithm which should perform actually quite good um, shows, um, yeah, let's say an image which is of very low quality, but then again, I mean, using this approach, you can improve it significantly. And the main point is here to pay a significant amount of attention to the edge structures and their directionality. And again, combining the model-based with the deep learning approach. Okay, so now, I mean, these were two approaches, which in some sense had the philosophy to use model-based approaches as far as they are reliable and then complement it with deep learning. Now, so we saw these two approaches, um, but still then you can wonder now, I mean, I have these methods, um, how can I interpret those results? Because as I said, I mean, for the data-based side, so here the deep learning side, we don't have error bounds, we don't have precise, let's say, precise knowledge about uh, the errors which we impose. So that brings us into the area of what's called interpretability or explainability. So this area aims to understand if I already have an algorithm which uses an, a neural network or which is entirely based on a neural network, uh, which is trained, but we just have it. We don't know how it was trained. We just got it. Uh, how can I interpret the results? How do I determine, for instance, which features of the input data is are important for the decision? For instance, in medical images, if you would use this now for, uh, let's say, cancer detection, then you could ask these questions. What are the key features of my, my original image? Um, and so the way people usually approach this in the classical sense is if you have an image, and you have a classifier, so here in the easiest case, you want to classify digits, then they put a heat map on it, which means that depending on the color coding of each pixel, 
this pixel is very important or not that important for the decision. Yeah? So I have a relevance score assigned to each of those pixels. And um, so why is this important? Well, I mean, it would be, for instance, important to recognize if the network does something strange, um, then you would realize that maybe the network bases its decision on some part of the image which it should not. So, for instance, there is also this example of uh, a training data set which had a watermark on uh, most of those images of one class. And then basically the neural network based its decision just on this watermark, which you certainly don't want. I mean, it's a smart decision by the neural network, but this is not what you want because then your generalization abilities are limited. And so things like this you can detect by these methods, what you can also detect is if you have very complicated data and you train a neural network to, I don't know, for instance, you have molecules, you train a neural network to detect certain properties of it, um, and the network seems to be very good in it, then you can go back and aim to understand on which parts the network bases its decision and then also learn from it, maybe. Uh, so, but what I would like to discuss with you here, I mean, there are numerous algorithms, but uh, most are very heuristic. And what I would like to show you here is an algorithm where you also have a good understanding of what these relevant scores actually really mean. Because we will formulate an optimization problem which will solve it. Uh, so we can then talk about a good relevance map and also for extended to challenging modalities. How is this algorithm set up? It's based on information theory, weight distortion theory. So there the guideline is, um, so this comes from telecommunication. You have two persons, one person has a message. She wants to transmit the message to the other person, but she trans wants to transmit very few data, a very small rate. But the other person should still understand the message and the error which this person makes is then the distortion. Now, and you can imagine that's a trade-off. The more you send, the less the error. Now, we would like to now, if we have a classification function and an input signal, we would like to use it to determine what relevant pixels are. So let's assume this one person, which is always called Alice for some reason, has the original image and has the classifier. And the classifier says it's a monkey. The second person, which is always called Bob, has also the classifier. Now, Alice would like to send few, a few pixels, the relevant pixels to Bob, so that the network can still recognize it as a monkey. So she sends part of the image, but now Bob has the problem that his classifier only operates on entire images, but not on parts of the image. So you need to bring it again up to the full image size, but not distort this meaning in some sense. And so maybe one way to go is to obfuscate it by random pixels. Then he puts this image in his classifier and hopefully he gets the same, um, the same output. Yeah, so this is why it's on S it is just the original image and on the complement it's the NOS. So the rate is how many pixels I sent. So here you see I aim for a sparse, for an efficient, concise explanation. And then uh, the distortion is the error which I make in the classification. Oh, and so this you see here, this is just copied from the previous slide. This is a distortion, the error which I make. And what I aim for is have a very small number of pixels, a small rate but so that the distortion is still bounded by, let's say, some epsilon. So this gives me a very precise meaning of what a relevant pixel actually is. Unfortunately, this is NP-hard to compute. So we need to modify it slightly. We cannot directly compute this minimizer. And what we do is we bring it into the continuous domain, or we make it into a continuous problem, I should say, instead of saying a pixel is relevant or not we give it a relevance score between zero and one. The obfuscation, the distortion can be found in a similar way. And instead of counting the number of pixels, I now place the little R1 norm on my coefficient. And remember, 
We already said before, the L1 norm promotes sparsity. And if I do that, then I can formulate a very precise minimization problem now for my uh, interpretability problem. So you see here, you have a distortion, you have the rate, the size, the, let's say the, the precision or the conciseness of the explanation, and then a lambda which balances between both. Good, so let's see how that works. For the first, we take a neural network which is trained on MNIST. And we have here one image, and you would like to analyze how the network determined that this is indeed a six. You see here various explanations of other types of algorithms. And here you see our algorithm. You see, I mean, the explanation is very precise, very concise, very sparse. And it also nicely recognizes that this opening of the gap should be important for the decision, or the network takes this also for the importance of the decision. And so you can also compare it now, um, let's say in a quantitative way with other approaches. If you have here the, the rate, the number of pixels which are relevant versus the error, and you see our, our approach performs the best in this sense, it gives a very small error with a very small rate. Then you can say, well, I mean, why do I obfuscate with random pixels? Maybe that's not very natural. The network has not seen that. It falls out of the data manifold. And so you might want to go beyond that. Also, maybe pixel-based explanations are um, too simplistic. You would like to have more higher level explanations. And so to approach the first problem, what we did here was to use, instead of this obfuscation with random pixels, to use a trained in-painting network. Uh, so it's trained on some data, which you give it, but then it gives more natural in-paintings and more natural obfuscations. To take the other problem, you can expand images, for instance, in wavelets, shearlets, and then place the interpretation, the relevance score on the coefficient of those. This gives you then higher level explanations. And let me show you two numerical examples. Um, so this is audio processing. Um, we have a neural network which determines or classifies instruments. And we all know that certainly the phase is more important than the magnitude. And the um, classification, uh, sorry, the interpretability approach, which analyzes now the neural network, detects that indeed the neural network bases its decisions foremost on the face information. Then maybe an even more complicated explanation is related to our project here on telecommunication. So the question here was. Um, in a different project, you have cell phone users, these are these red dots. You have a city map, these are these blue buildings. You have the position of the cell phone tower, which is here. And now you would like to compute the radio map. So you would like to compute at each pixel of your city map the quality of reception. Ah, and so you can do this very nicely and extremely efficient with a certain combination of units. We also have work on this, which is already published. But what you see then is, I mean, some curiosity here. What you, If you look closely, you see the network produced this black blob, which seems kind of unintuitive. Uh, because, I mean, it's, it's here, it's, let's say, the city square. So why is the reception that bad here? Or why does it indicate that the reception is that bad? Then, I mean, this Interpretability approach shows that the network bases its decision on those cell phone users. And in fact, those cell phone users um, have a bad reception. So the network deducted that there need to be a bad reception here. And in fact, then what turned out later on was that in the city map, in the original city map, the building was missing. So the network did something correct in this sense. But I mean, if the network would have done something Incorrect, one could have also understood it in this manner. Let me conclude um, my talk. The main message was here that the 
best you can do is not throw everything overboard, but combine the model-based side with the deep learning side with, that sends the data-driven side. We looked in particular at so-called inverse problems. I showed you one particular approach from the model-based side using this versatile system of shields for sparse regularization. Um, we combined this with neural networks in these two approaches, learning the invisible and the wave the, the edge and even more the wavefront extractor, which you can also then use for CT. And in the very last part, I briefly talked about interpretability and I showed you how you can introduce a very general, very flexible interpretability approach, which gives also very complicated explanations and which also outperforms current methods, particularly at very precise uh, explanations. And with this, I'd like to conclude and Thank you very much for your attention.